So can you talk about that one? Yeah, that one's all closed up. That one's done. Uh, I had my final uh, court. Uh, my county does a corners in quest, which is weird. Like kind of is like a final on this day, you did okay kind of thing. Um, so I had that a couple months ago. Um, so yeah, it's on the internet too. Um, but uh, basically typical DV call. Um, we get called to DV uh, the reporting party stating that her uh, husband or son's father um, is at the door trying to kick in the door with a gun. And, you know, <laughs> these days everyone says somebody has a gun. And to it be gets honest people with you, there, it gets, it it gets, gets you there. guys there faster. It does. Mm -hmm. But in fairness, everybody is carrying a gun these days. We get, we've quadrupled the guns pulling off the street this Roger year. My, that. my department has done a killer job. There's some go getters at my department. They've done a killer job this year getting guns off the street. But um, now we got a second reporting party. And she's saying, hey, my neighbor, there's some guy with a gun trying to kick in the door. All right. So, so, it's so now it's like, oh, okay, this is legit, right? So we get there and we're a couple officers deep and uh, he's on the staircase at the bottom of the staircase and she's got an upstairs apartment. So my partner tries to talk to him a little bit. My sergeant just happened to be there, which they generally show up later because they're coming from somewhere else. Um, and a couple other officers. And this guy starts beelining up the stairs. He's got his hands in his pockets. He's not really talking to us. But we know that's her apartment and we know he's possibly armed. So, of course, we follow up the staircase as we're coming up the staircase. This is a bad situation. It is. You guys are at the bottom. He's at the top. Well, staircases and hallways, that's, right? Like CQB 101, that's right. like where you don't want to be, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Staircases on certain calls still to this day. I'm like, oh, here we go. Staircase. And this isn't with your team. This is with the no, guys. This is on patrol. This is like my second call of the night. Uh, cleared briefing, went to a 5150 and actually cleared that call very quickly to go to this one. Um, so at, at this point he's backtracking up the stairs. He kind of turns and I'm just behind the, the primary shooting officer and uh, officer with less lethal. And I see him drawing So you're number three guy and number three guy, but we're kind of staggered. So I'm like number two ish. Okay. Like we're me and number two are like shoulder to shoulder. Okay. And, um, I actually see the gun start to come out. And if uh, you watch my video, you can, they don't depict it in the video. My, my department put out, but if you pause it, you can see the gun on my body camera. I saw it. Oh, you, what you're saying is they didn't do the edit, but if you, they didn't do the yeah. circle, they did it for the primary shooting officer. But if you look at mine, you can see, oh, the gun from, I gotcha. From the my, different camera angles. Correct. I'm correct. with you. Okay. They showed my camera angle, but they didn't like slow it down and depict like circle. The gun. Yeah. yeah. So I start to say something. I forget what I was going to say, but you hear me start to talk and then shots ring out. And I, it's that fast, that fast. Um, I kind of lost sight of some people as they're moving around. Cause it's like a, um, what do I call it? Like a platform, like a like, mezzanine up top. Yeah. yeah there's like, apartments left and right. There's, I think four apartments total, two on one side, two on the other. So I hear the shots, I hear boom. And what I thought was boom, boom, boom. So my mind, it's crazy how fast your brain processes stuff because my brain instantly went to this dude shot at my partner who is like my little brother, right? I've been with him through thick and thin. Mind you, his wife is the dispatcher. Wow, it's a tight family. Yeah. And so um, I'm thinking this dude just shot at my partner and he shot back, boom, boom. Right. right? So, so one, the first boom was coming from the suspect and the well, second that's, two that's were That's what coming. my brain picked up. What actually happened is my partner shot all three shots. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this guy was high as a kite. He had everything in his system, right? So um, I think that had to deal with the fact that he was trying to shoot at us, but probably couldn't due to his mental. Because he got it out. He got, he it, got out. it out. Um, but my partner shot. And so I think we were going upstairs. So I don't remember if I kind of flinched uh, or if I slipped on a stair, like but in mid step somewhere, there, there's a surveillance camera from the apartment complex and you can see me kind of drop down one step as the shots ring out. But my mind, I'm like, go get them. Right. Like that's my boy. Like I'm not going to leave him up there. So, uh, I start going up the stairs and as I'm going up it, he goes flat on the stairs. The suspect or your partner? My partner. Oh boy. So we talked about that hallway, right? That hallway staircase, CQB is the worst place to be, right? Yeah, well, you're on no man's land yeah, right now. Kudos to my partner. He was smart enough that the only place I can get cover is down. Is down. Well, he had a malfunction. I didn't know that. He had a, he had a malfunction off after his third shot. So he smartly lays down on the staircase to try to fix it. But in my mind, watching him out of the corner of my eye, I thought he was dead. I, I thought he was shot. Yeah, okay. I'm like, holy crap, this is it. This is every cop's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm my friend and partner is shot and I'll try not to get choked up right now, but I still tell him to this day, every time I think about it, I, I relive that feeling of 
that he was shot, you know? I can't and that's, this. that yeah. is like, there's no other way to put it. It's a shitty feeling. It is the worst, right? So at this point, I still can't really see the suspect um, because I was also using the staircase to my advantage, right? right. The so best you can, yeah. I start situation. slowly cresting it up stair by stair. And in my mind, I was two-handed. I mean, like, oh, right? Like right. you do at the range, right? Two-handed, everything's Side there. Picture. Everything was perfect, right? Well, somebody later, one of my buddies, the next morning after everything goes down, he goes, dude, that was one-handed on a staircase, dude. And you hit him. And I'm like, what? No, nah, dude, I had two hands on the gun. And he's like, no, nah, dude, you had one hand on wow, the gun. Wow, this is fascinating to me that, I mean, this is because, I mean, what are we talking about? It just seconds five seconds and what's a trip is there's so much that i remember like clear as day and stuff that's like oh yeah that did happen you know <laughs> um and so what ended up happening is because i'm going up the stairs i felt unbalanced and i grabbed the handrail with my left Which hand left you one-handed it left me one-handed and as i crest up he's still moving and again clear as day like my mind just goes whoosh, right onto the barrel and the guns pointed at me. I can clearly see his fingers inside the trigger guard. Mm -hmm. I, I see building, building and a little backdrop. There's like a sliver of no building. And I'm like, here we go. He's moving. It's pointing at me threat. Boom, boom. Actually, it was pretty, pretty precise. Cause I knew I was shooting one handed. And so I shot one and I'm pretty sure that one I'd have to go back and look at all that, but I'm pretty sure that one skipped the deck of the, of the platform there and it missed. And then my second one went up into his leg. Um, like right up in the guts where you want to get everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of my partner shots, believe it or not, actually went through and clipped his heart. So he was bleeding out internally already. So, but he's still going, but he was still going, which people, like, which is an important thing. I think we can talk about that later. Yeah. Actually. Um, yeah, he kept going. Um, and so at that point, it, and this is all happening rapidly, rapidly. My partner says malfunction. He's going to get out of there. So I say, go, he, we basically do a quick bound. He goes down. I cover the dudes like basically stopping to move, but he's still got the gun pointed at us. I go into OODA loop. The only moment of this whole thing that I wish I didn't do is I just totally went into OODA loop mood going down the stairs because I was afraid for the rest of my officers. And I just kept repeating. He's still got the gun pointed at us. He's still, cause I didn't want anybody else to rush up there. Yeah. To um, walk into so, motion. And the other thing was, is when we got down there, so now I'm pointing, I'm covering right on the staircase and we're starting to start communication with him and all that. But my partner, he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Not, not like bad, but he's like trying to work, right? He's like trying to get this. The, trying to clear his gun. Well, he's, he clears his gun. Okay. Then he tries to get the, the shield out of the sergeant's car. Like he's doing what he's trained to do. Oh, right? gotcha. Okay. But okay. with my combat medic training and I've seen it, people get hit and don't know they're hit. Right. Like when it's fight or flight and you're fighting, you're going to fight. And if it's not like life altering, you could go quite a time in a fight and realize Oh, I'm hit somewhere like not important. Like I'm not bleeding out artillery, but I'm hit. And this goes back to you thinking he got shot once and then put two on this guy. Correct. Already. Correct. So this, cause you don't know, this is still where my mind's at. Right. So I start hollering at other officers, like stop him in his tracks, stand him still check and, him. and top to bottom, check him. Right. And so, um, we check him. He's good. Um, at that point, I, and it's crazy things you think about, cause this is all very fast. I think I'm even thought about this before I got somebody to check them, but I thought about doing a tack load, right? <laughs> Training. Like okay, yeah, right. I, I was in a gunfight. There's a lull in the gunfight. I'm going to tack load. And my brain went, no dude, you fired twice in, you know, I run extended. So it's 19 plus one. I'm like, you got 18 rounds, dude. Like you're good. You're good. And so I like, I, I think in my body camera, you even see me go like this to reach down on my exterior carrier to do attack reload. And I'm like, no, like you're good. Right. So it's crazy what What's your process and what your brain goes back to, right? Like what is your brain referred to? Yeah. So they always say it, it defaults to your lowest level of training. Yes. 100%. Right? So man, I mean, that is, that's intense. I mean, so we haven't even finished yet. So he goes back downstairs. He's looking for the shield. You're yelling, Hey, stop that guy. Yep. Stop him. Let's make sure we check him out. Guy up. Guy up top is now bleeding out because yep. he's been hitting the heart, but you don't know that nope. he's been hitting the heart by my partner, hitting the leg. It went up into some guts up in his inner thigh. So, okay. So there was a, a third officer on the stairs. You guys have both kind of backed off. Yeah. Now. So the third officer and the Sergeant, as soon as shots ran out, they came down to get a, get a position of advantage. Right. Like I said, I was literally just going up there. Cause I wasn't going to leave him. Like right. if I'm going down, he's going with me. Right. Um, so at this point, things kind of calmed down a little bit. I'm trying to do communication. You talked about all the jobs I've done before SWAT. I was on the crisis negotiations team. 
Um, everyone knows I'm a talker. So that was a good position for me, but wow. went to FBI school, uh, for that. For oh, shit. Yeah. It was 40 hour FBI course for that. It was cool. So my Sergeant comes over great Sergeant, right. And he comes over and he taps me and he just tells me like, I forget what he whispers now, but something like CNT or I need you. Like he basically told me like, I need you to flip the switch. And like, I took Work a deep breath yeah. and like, you can tell in my voice, I went from like, oh shit, oh, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, shit to, and like literally after that, um, he ends up my primary, the primary shooter, um, my partner, he gets sequestered, which is normally the mm -hmm. case. Well, at this point I'm knee deep and trying to negotiate with this guy. So kind of, kind of, yeah, kind of outside the norm. I spent like, I think the next 20 minutes negotiating with this guy because of my experience, right? I'm crisis intervention trained. I'm CNT trained as a negotiator. Meanwhile, he's bleeding out. So, well, we made attempts to go up the stairs, right? We went up the stairs and, you know, I, I'd said everything in the book, you know, I talk to this guy, like he's my friend. That's, mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it when I'm negotiating. Right. Like I'm talking to it. Like it's you dude, like it's Scott. And I want Scott to, to get out of this and not get hurt. So I'm pleading with him like, Hey dude, I'm a medic. I'll, I'll give you aid. We'll get you to our, our trauma one center. They save everybody. They're going to save your life. Just please don't do this. No one wants to hurt you everything. And I meant it. Like, I honestly meant it. Like people say, Oh, that's all talk. That's all. No, I meant it. I don't want to see this man die. And I don't want to have a hand in this man dying. Like I want him to live. And so did that for about 20 minutes. Finally, I get pulled away. Um, they go to less lethal, get no reaction. And so they go in, they, uh, handcuff him, all that search him, recover the gun. His finger was still in the trigger guard. Mm. Um, so they had to pin him with the shield and be very careful, get that gun out. Um, and then obviously at this point, paramedics have been just itching to get in there. So as soon as they go code four and it's all clear, they rush up there. Uh, he did not make it. Um, and so at that point we just went into protocol, you know, get sequestered, which by the way, that is extremely stressful, probably like the most stressful experience of my career. Can't imagine, man. I know I did right. Right. I know I did what I had to do, but in this day and age, being a cop shooting anybody is like, okay, am I going to be on the media? Am I going to, you know what I mean? Like, how is this going to be portrayed? Right? Oh man, I, I, I'm just trying to process it all myself. And that is a, uh, that's a pretty compelling story. And I'm just thinking about from start to finish, all the things you might hear, like as a civilian about all the bad things that, that police officers have to deal with out there on a daily basis. And oftentimes we don't even hear about it. So first off, it starts off as what, uh, what, to my knowledge is one of the da most dangerous situations you guys can walk into, which is a domestic violence call. Yep. Right. Yep. So it starts there. Number two, we have two witnesses that say the guy's got a gun. So that's, that's, a, that's obviously a big, a big problem. Yeah. That's exacerbated by the dudes all jacked up on whatever he's jacked up on, right. From a narcotics perspective or whatever. And you, you don't know this. We have a staircase, we have a platform, we have a hallways at the top, and ultimately there's shooting. So, and within that, you've got a malfunction of a weapon, right? And all the confusion that, that happens there. And then now stress on stress on stress on stress yeah. on top of all that, man. I mean, that is, you talk about how your brain sort of deals with all that in the moment. When, if it, when was the, was there a point where you kind of stepped back from all that after the negotiation, after he's been, you know, kind of scooped up and carted away and whatever, uh, and you guys get sequestered, how long before it kind of hits you? And what does that feel like? I think once I got sequestered, it hit me, you know, I, I, the, a different Sergeant had showed up. Luckily we had some specialty stuff going on that night. So there was more officers and, and an additional Sergeant there that normally aren't there. So we had a lot of resources. And so I know this Sergeant and he, you know, we're like a family. So he knows me, he knows my now wife. So the first thing I said is call her. Cause I don't want her to get the call from somebody, somebody else. else. Cause the word travels and people mean well. Right. But I don't want her to get the call. Yeah. From I can't imagine somebody, being on that you know? Yeah. So, um, I said, call her, stand right in front of me and do it. I know I can't talk, talk to her. To her He's yeah. like, put in the number, no hesitation, calls her, talks to her, lets her know what's going on. Um, and I think that's where it hit me. I'm like, oh crap, this is her worst nightmare too. Like she's at home in bed and she's getting that phone call. Right. So I think that's the first time it really hit me. We're making my wife cry over there, by the way, she's in the, in, in the studio and she's over there crying. So, um, I'm not going to look over there cause then I'll cry. Um, 
but she got that call. And I think that's when it really hit me like, oh man, like this is her worst nightmare too. You know, um, people don't realize it's really hard being with a cop, a firefighter, any first responder. And so I think that's where it really hit me. But then I jumped right back into worry mode because now I got to go. I can't talk to anybody about it. Right. When you're being sequestered, you can't talk to anybody about it. You can talk. I mean, we could talk about the football game on Sunday. We could talk about what we're going to do this weekend, but we can't talk about the event. And all you want to do, you just want to talk about it. Like, right. It's like this weight and you just want to, but you can't well, because it's also your family, right? Right. Well, I got to, uh, at some point, uh, one of the, uh, captains came in and he's like, Hey, have you called your family? And I said, no. And he says, okay, here, call your family. You know? Cause again, somebody always has to make sure you're not talking about the event. So called my mom again, woke her up in the middle of the night. Hey mom. Hey, you don't sound right. She could hear in my voice. I'm okay. Then you have to relive the whole thing all over again. Oh, I relived it every second, even if I wasn't talking about it that night. So I tell her, Hey, I'm fine. You know? Um, but I was involved. There was a shooting. Um, I was a shooter. I am okay. And, uh, I'm going to be sequestered. It's going to be a long night and I'll call you on my way home tomorrow. It'll probably be in the morning. Cause mind you, this is like nine, 10 o'clock at night. Right. I already know I'm going to get out seven, eight o'clock the next morning. So, um, you know, it was hard, but it's just, like I said, you want to talk about it, right? That natural, uh, human emotion is to talk about it, right? Like, good or bad, like you share things with other human beings. Right. So that was it's, really it's hard. One of the, it's one of the, the few things we have as humans that separate us. Right. You know, it's, it's having those conversations and you want somebody to tell you, Hey, it's okay. You're okay. You did right. the right thing. You know, especially like your senior officers or people you look up to, you see them walking around cause they're investigating this, right? Like one of the detectives that came to investigate mine is one of my good friends. You know, I was in his wedding. He was just in my wedding and I'm looking at him and I'm looking at my other buddy who we hang out outside of work and I'm looking at them and they're looking at me and they, they know I'm tripping, right? Like I'm, so that's the whole thing here. Like, so now you're, you've, you're being processed and yep. you're having to process mm -hmm. and now other people are having to process that too. You know, they're having to process. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at them having these conversations and man, if I'm having that conversation with you, I don't care how well I know you, I'm walking on eggshells right now. Yeah. Like, just like, dude, is Greg okay? Like, yeah. But you can't, because I know I'm not really okay. Yeah. You can like you know? say like, I'm okay. Right. But it's like, you want, you want more than that. You want to tell them what happened and then be like, yeah, dude, you did the right thing. But you can't, you can't. So that was hard. Um, and of course, uh, you know, they process you. It's funny. You said the word process. Cause the other hard thing for me and all this is they photograph you. Right. And so they photograph me as I was right. Left, right. Turn around. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting really upset because I felt like a criminal. Like I did uh, like something you're going wrong through yeah. shots. Well, dude, they took my gun out. Of course they count your rounds. They take pictures of your firearm. They take your firearm, you know, and I, this looked, is not something you could prepare for. No, not at all. And you know, um, my department does a really good job preparing us. So that's probably why I did so well with it, but it's still hard. Right. Um, and I looked over at, we have a peer support team I looked over at one of my peer support, uh, people. And I, I look up to her. She's a, um, been at the department a long time. She does a lot of good stuff for our department. And I look over at her and she goes, are you okay? I said, no. She said, why? I said, I feel like a criminal right now. And I do not like, like I was getting angry. Like I was pissed off. Seems very natural. I, it was a range of emotions, man. There's times where I thought I was going to cry and I'm not a big crier. Um, I thought I was going to cry. Um, there was times where I thought, you know, I was angry. There's times where I was scared. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I was scared. Like like I said, am I going to end up in the news? How's this going to work out? But long story short, uh, we finally were the last two to get interviewed. I'm the last one. I think I finished my interview at like seven 30 in the morning. So now I've been up all night, right? Nerves, stomachs turning, couldn't even eat kind of thing. Um, and then I go home and I try to sleep and can't, I think we sat in bed until how could you, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess I could see like, just like falling the face first onto the couch yeah. and like the problem is, being is, is for me i was past that point right so well, you got adrenaline and cortisol running through you like crazy right now so that's keeping you up right. right but some people do and some people go back to a hotel room or something while they're being sequestered and they sleep before they get interviewed you know but for me i was like anxious you know so i wasn't going to sleep so we we talked to about you know, 11 in the morning or so. And I think I slept maybe a handful full hours that day. And then, and then I started fielding calls, you know, I wanted to reach out to the homies. Um, I got a good tribe. I got a good village and, uh, they take care of me. So 
Um, people were coming by the house, people were DoorDash sending DoorDash gift cards. You know, our, our community is outstanding. Um, and so I started fielding calls and just kind of like trying to get normal. Um, my department does a good job with mental health. So you, you automatically get a week, but me and my partner both ended up taking a second week um, just so that we had time to go talk to our department therapist, which they have. I mentioned the peer support. Um, my department is very ahead of that. Luckily, a sergeant before my time, I got to work for him before he retired, but him and some other people put together our peer support team. Um, uh, Beth, um, I can't think of Beth's last name right now, um, but Beth has her office um, here in the Bay Area. And she, if you're a cop listening to this and you, you probably know the name Beth, um, she's awesome. We go and see her. Um, she's amazing. Um, so you just said something there that strikes me and that is the try to get normal <laughs> after being th- having gone through what you went yeah. through, trying to get normal. I, 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 I can't remember why I heard this. Um, I, I can't remember, but it was, it was, a, I think it was, it was a documentary in a, um, on combat veterans that had come back and they were seeking help for, you know, for mental and emotional help. And I think what the, the, the therapist was saying is, is this is your normal now. And now you need to figure out how to deal with what the new, the new normal is yeah. um, it's never going to be the same ever again after having gone through what you've gone through. Right. So um, you've, you've, you've just sort of talking about the, the, the process of seeing and getting some help and getting some people on your team and all of the things like all of the people, right? Like, so the people that you work with, the family that's around you, right? Your wife, um, fiance at the time, it's your wife, uh, the, the counselors, right. And then there's, there's a department that puts you in, there's, there's a middle person for, for, for all this stuff. And they're taking a village or a team to, to do this. Is there a book? Like, is there, is there, how does that outlines how all this should work? Like, or is it just figuring it out as you go? There is a book. Uh, I forget the exact name of it and I should know it's, uh, I'll get it to you and you can link it in here or whatever, but it's uh, basically surviving law enforcement. It's a white and red okay. book. And if you're in law enforcement, you probably saw it at your academy, but it's not just for you. It's for your, your spouses and your family too. Dude, I I, I was actually being like no, the, almost sarcastic no, and asking that question, but this literally is a li- thing. Literally somebody wrote a book about how to survive a career in law enforcement. Um, and then, like I said, uh, luckily the stigma, right. With people like Greg and Jesse, you know, my good friends yep. over at the overwatch, Overwatch. Yep. um, and all these other places is the stigma around men's m- mental health is going away. And I think I told you what we've talked about before. I was like that dude that was like, I ain't ever going to a therapist. Like, nah, dude, that ain't me. Right. But that stigma has gone away and there's things in place and I'm fortunate, right? Like to those listening, I'm not a combat veteran, but our combat veterans, why they're so broken is they didn't get the opportunity I did. Right. Like I had a traumatic incident. I got like two weeks off of work to deal with it. I have to go back to work the next day. I went and talked to a therapist. Like I got that time to process. These dudes don't get the time, right? They go right back out that night or or maybe they're still in it. You know what I mean? For that amount of time. And when your brain doesn't get that time to process, you can't just put it in a box, put it on a shelf. It's a part of me, but I'm good. Right. Like yeah. I mean that, like I tell people all the time, like I got taken care of, I'm good. Right. I go back to work. Good. Right. But I can only imagine if I had to relive that night after night for weeks, months on end and not get the opportunity to deal with that. <sighs> like to my veterans listening. Shh. I, I get this. I, I, I give them all the kudos. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm getting at, man. Cause I, I, people the, don't, give them enough respect. In my opinion, it's just not enough. There's never, there's never enough we can do for them ever. 